Hi everyone and welcome to Dennis Deep Cuts, the 57th installment of this fine YouTube series. Today we're going to talk about bands that became bands. Let's see what happens. As someone that's been in uh, numerous bands, I know how difficult it is to have a certain combination of people work together to create something magical. Uh, and then to do it more than once, mind-blowing. Um, one of the biggest issues of being in bands is that you share your creativity, your ideas, your passion with other people. Uh, you might not always have the same idea, you might not always have the same um, motivation. And um, interpersonal relationship, group dynamics, plus the external pressure of uh, circumstances you can't really control can be quite taxing and uh, I guess that's why bands break up and soul artists can sort of soldier on for years and years and years. Um, today we're going to talk about a couple of bands that managed to break up for whatever reason. I mean sometimes people die and sometimes people can't get along and the bulk of that band continued on to do another band that is also great. Um, it happens not that common, especially if it's like a big chunk of the band. So I wanted to do a list where at least half of the band went on to do another band that is also pretty great. So that's what we're going to dig into today. So I'm going to give you a list of um, 10 bands that became 10 other bands. Let's do it. Let's start with one of the more influential uh, rock bands of all time. Uh, as far as it comes to goth music or post-punk, I'm of course talking about Bauhaus, Northampton. They started in 1978, broke up in 1983. This is their 92 album. Press the eject and give me the tape. Uh, they put out four albums, all marvelous. Um, they broke up in 1983 and then they dispersed to do other projects and in 1985 they said let's get back together and maybe write some music and they set a date for a practice and the singer Peter Murphy uh, just didn't show up so the other three guys said well fuck that guy let's do a band of our own and the band is of course Love and Rockets this is a debut album from 1985 while Bauhaus was dark and moody and weird um, Love and Rockets is poppier and brighter and uh, also just pretty fantastic um, so both bands are pretty great and both bands are really recommended. Uh, Peter Murphy did a tour with uh, the bass player David J a couple of years ago where they kind of made, so, sold it as a Bauhaus tour and uh, I was at the Stockholm show and that Stockholm show ended with Peter Murphy getting arrested because he threw uh, beer bottles at the mixing desk and at the crowd and it was, uh, it was quite the scene. So yeah, there you have it. <laughs> One thing that's also true is that when you have a small scene and uh, there's just like a, a, a limited amount of people that plays in bands, a lot of people end up playing in bands together over the course of the years. And I mean, that's true definitely for Umeå, where I'm from. It's a small town, small scene, small world, not a lot of people. Um, and it's obviously true for Washington, D.C., one of the best uh, hardcore cities in the world. I could probably do just a full episode on uh, DC punk musician that played in, in bands together. But today I'm going to talk about Grey Matter, who's one of my favorite DC punk bands. Uh, they were banned from 1983 to 86. And this is the Take It Back uh, mini album or whatever it's from 1986. I, I think I have four copies of this record. It's just fantastic. Uh, they got back together in 1990 and sold it on to 1993. So there's like one album before they break up and then one album. Uh, for the reunion and it's all great but when they broke up in 1986 uh, two of the guys got together with Ian and Jeff Nelson from Minor Threat and at that point they were doing uh, the, the Egg Hunt project and they tried to get band together it didn't really work out Ian bailed and then they got the third guy Jeff Turner from Grey Matter and they started a band together called Three that just put out this one record and I think it came out after they broke up because this is from 1980 nine and three broke up in 1988 um it's their sole their one and only record 
And it's a really, really great record of that like late 80s DC sound. Um, quite reminiscent of Grey Matter, of course, but it has a touch of its own. I love Grey Matter and I think 3 is one of those underrated disco records that people don't talk about that much. And um, fantastic. Both bands, fantastic. Next one you will know if you're a Swedish person or a Swedish punk, but if you're not, I'll tell it to you anyway. The best, most important punk band of all time in Sweden is of course Ebba Grön. Uh, they started in Rogsved outside of Stockholm in 1977, broke up in 1983. This is their third record from 1983. Uh, it started as a three piece and before this record, the singer from Kriminella Guitar joined the band uh, playing keyboards. And um, when this record was done, the bass player said, I've had enough, I don't want to be a rock star anymore, and moved out to the country. And the rest of the band um, continued on with a new bass player and a saxophone player under the name Imperiet. Uh, Stry, the guy from Kriminella Guitar, and Tåström from Ebba Grön had a project called Rymn Imperiet for a short second. So they said, let's revive that and, and call ourselves Imperiate. Um, Imperiate's great, this record. I love this record. I think it, it could probably be been the fourth Ebba Gren record. After this record, Stru left. And uh, after that, uh, the drummer, the Ebba Gren drummer got kicked out. So it's basically Tostrom and some new people. But Imperiate put out six records and they're all pretty awesome. Um, they're very, very 80s. They're very theatrical and dramatic and kind of post-punkish, but in a, in a weird rock and roll type of way. Um, they're great. Someone, a friend of mine just made a movie about them. If you get a chance to check it out, it's really, really good. And uh, yeah, check out Imperia. They have a record where they did like a greatest, they try to make it in the States. So they made a record where all their greatest hits are uh, repurposed in English. And it's so-so, but you can check it out. Uh, but anyway, Imperial's great, Ebba Gion's great. Fantastic, Swedish punk. Sometimes um, bands become two bands, and that's a prime example of that now. I'm talking about some of the best music that I know. I'm talking about The Birthday Party from Australia, the band from 1978 to 1983. This is their Final EP, The Bad Seed. Uh, most of you then, of course, know that uh, Mick Harvey and uh, Nick Cave went on to form uh, Nick Cave and The Bad Seeds. They're still uh, active to this day and they have a record coming out after the summer. I'm very, very excited about that. Uh, and most of you, I assume, know that the amazing guitar player Roland S. Howard, together with Mick Harvey, joined. Crime and the City Solution. Crime and the City Solution were an Australian band. Uh, they relocated to London and then Berlin. So half of the birthday party went to the Bad Seeds and half the birthday party went to Crime and the City Solution. I think Crime and the City Solution is one of the most underrated bands of all time. Um, the early stuff sounds a lot like the birthday party especially Roland S. Howard's angular weird guitar work and like kind of the, the weird demented blues music. Uh, Roland left the band after the first album and EP to start the DC Mortal Souls together with his brother Harry Howard who's also played on these records. And Mick Harvey left a while after that to focus on the Bad Seeds. Uh, Crime and the City Solutions sold it on for a couple of records with another lineup and then they got back together and uh, they put out a record last year that was on my top 10 list of last year's best records. But yeah, it's pretty fantastic how one band can spawn two fantastic bands. So let's talk about Umeå for a little bit. Uh, small town, small scene. Like six people played in like 10 different bands or something like that. Um, let's talk about that for a little bit. Also, you might not know this, but in the 90s, uh, I did a record label called Desperate Fight Records together with my friend Jose. 
And in the late 90s, um, we had a thing with the International Noise Conspiracy called the Black Mass Collective. We put out some music and put out some political pamphlets. And then in the early 2000s, I started a record label called Nivo Records that put out 40 records, I think, with just local bands. And um, two of those, two of my favorite records on those labels were pretty much the same people. Um, I'm, of course, talking about The Vicious, uh, only one only full-length record called Alienated. Vicious is, of course, Saren Andre that plays with Mean Invasion, and the guy called Eric that played the bass in this band, and then uh, Robert, uh, who played in the band called Regulations before this, on vocals. And um, things soured between them and Andre for reasons that we don't need to get into, but uh, the three of them, Eric, Sarah, and Robert, reshuffled, and they came out with a band Mass History. Um, Mass History was great. They put out two records and um, they were just about to make it big, I think, in Sweden. This is the first record, Vordale of Storm, from, I think, 2007. Um, and then they broke up because reasons. Robert is now a big rock star in Sweden and um, Sarah, Sarah plays with me, of course, in Invasion. Eric is a photographer and Kaisa that joined, uh, she plays in a band called Dreaming Wild and she was also in an Invasion for a little bit. Uh, yeah. There you go. Small scene, small world. A lot of people playing the same type of bands. But these two records, highly recommended records. All right, let's talk about some psychedelic rock. I don't do that often enough on this channel. Uh, the band Art from Carlisle in the UK put out this fantastic record in 1967 called Supernatural Fairy Tales. Um, I love this record. It's a little, little bit of a masterpiece of, of heavy psych rock. Uh, when Gary Wright joined the band, they changed their name to Spooky Tooth. And this is their second record from uh, 1969. One of those bands where their records didn't sell, no one really cared. So it's one of those bands where the interpersonal relationship seems to be insanely messy. So after this Spooky 2 record, uh, a lot of people left the band and they soldiered on and they did reunions, they broke up and they got back together. So all in all, I think it's like somewhere between seven and nine Spooky Tooth records, depending on uh, what, what lineup you want. Um, this record is great. Better By You, Better Than Me. It's a song that they wrote, and then when I was a young teenager, I heard it with Judas Priest, and I loved it. And it's a great record, and that's a great song. Um, people in Spooky Tooth went on to play in bands like Foreigner, Humble Pie, Mata Hoople, and the only ones, which I found pretty fantastic. Uh, one of these days, I want to do like a list of, of bands that... that or members of bands that played in, in something completely different and, and did start another band, like uh, like Algie Ward that was in The Damned and then he started the heavy metal band uh, Tank. Something like that. Let's see, let's see uh, if that, that could be a list. Maybe one of these days. One of the best Pop punk bands of all time is, of course, Descendants from Los Angeles. This is their 1982 debut record at Milo Goes College. Put up four records, and in 1987, Milo left, uh, I don't think for college, or maybe for college, I don't know, and um, left the band. And uh, the other guy decided to grab a new singer and uh, rebrand themselves as all. Uh, the singer they got was, of course, Dave Smalley, that played in DYS and Dag Nasty. They did two records with him and then he left and then they have had another two singers with all. Um, Descendants are great. All is great. They've always been sort of forced to live in the shadow of Descendants, but especially these early records are pretty fantastic. Um, just the, the same band with a different singer basically, which is a bit rare, I, I assume. Uh, Milo came back, Descendants put out a couple of more records and uh, they're still active. Not sure if all is active with their latest records from 2000, which feels recent, but that's a long, long time ago. A couple years back, I was in LA doing something rather, and um, 
someone came up to me and said, we're doing a screening of the Descendants All movie, which I can recommend. And they asked if I wanted to sing a couple of Descendants songs. And I said, yeah, sure. And when I showed up, it was Bill Stevenson and Carl Alvarez and Stephen, Stephen Egerton, uh, which is all in the Descendants. Uh, as the backing band and uh, then there's a bunch of singers singing the sentence songs I got super nervous, but it was fun. You can find the result on YouTube. It's fine. I was really nervous Let's talk about some fantastic noise rock from Austin, Texas um, Of course talk about Scratch Acid, the band from 1982 to 1987 they put out this one full-length record and two EPs um, before they broke up. When they broke up, uh, singer David Yao and guitar player David Sims moved to Chicago. Um, and in 1987, they started Jesus Lizard. Uh, first with the drum machine, I think, and then with a proper drummer. This is their debut album, Head from 1990. Jesus Lizard went on to put out um, six studio albums and a couple of live records and um, they broke up in 1999 and the last show that they ever played was here in Umeå. They um, put it at the Umeå Open Festival and it was, I, it was glorious, it was a fantastic show. Um, they got back together a couple of years later and then since a couple of years back they are playing shows sporadically on and off and um, yeah that show in 1999 was it was tremendous. <laughs> tremendous. Were you there? Did anyone go to that show? So good. Sometimes the death of a band member forces you to start a new band, and that's, of course, the tragic case with the, the Minuteman from San Pedro. They started in 1980 and broke up in 1985 when uh, singer D. Boone got killed at the age of 27, I think in a car accident. Uh, Mike Watt and George Hurley were at loss and didn't know what to do and they got hounded by a guy called Ed Crawford who was a massive Minuteman fan and he said, let's do something. And, and uh, finally they caved in and they started the band Firehose. Um, Minuteman was one of those bands that was so you know, they really define DIY. They really define a certain weirdness and a certain sound that was so punk. Yeah, you should check out the documentary We Jam at Kono. It's a marvelous lit documentary about that band. Um, and Firehose is different. I mean, you still have the same rhythm section. So that's, of course, similar. But um, everything else is pretty different, which I think it has to be. I think it's... It's sometimes it's unfair that we, because people have been in, in a certain band and now they're in this band, we have these pretty unrealistic expectations of people. And as someone that's been through that knows what it means, it can be quite liberating to be like, okay, we're going to do something completely different to sort of separate the ties from, from people's expectations. And um, I think that's a beautiful thing about being an artist or, or a you know, someone sort of wants to create and you always need to grow and you always need to move. And uh, sometimes we have a hard time accepting that because the first band meant so much to me and why are they now doing this with this other band? But uh, it's just a part of growth and it's a part of like, you know, just being true to who you are and to who you want to be. Um, so yeah, Minutemen, amazing. Firehose, amazing. Let's finish up Down Under uh, from Perth in Australia. We have the Victims. Uh, victims were banned from 1977 to 1979. They only put out two 7 inches and this here is a compilation of those two 7 inches plus some other stuff from 2019. Uh, those two 7 inches are some of the best punk rock I ever put to vinyl. Um, they're insanely expensive so this compilation is Perfect, even though I do have one of the seven inches on uh, radio pressing. Humble brag. Um, when they broke up, uh, singing Dave Faulkner, guitar player, and singing Dave Faulkner was uh, kind of trying to get something new going. And after a couple of full starts, he uh, enlisted drummer James Baker and he started the Hoodoo Gurus, which has uh, since become a staple 
of Australian garage rock. I love this first record. Um, Hudegur's first seven inch is fantastic. Um, after record two, James Baker obviously got kicked out of the band and uh, they became an institution and they reformed and they're still playing shows and Dave Faulkner is a very singular voice in Australian rock music, but in the early days, uh, two thirds of the victims were in the Hudegur's. And that's, uh, if that doesn't make you happy, then I don't, don't know what's gonna make you happy. And that is it. What's your favorite band that became another band? I mean, I know there's some super famous um, bands that became other bands that I didn't even touch upon today, but what's your favorite one? And uh, did I miss a cool one that I was like, oh shit, I didn't know those guys were in that band or girls? Um, let me know in the comments, in the comments section. And thank you for watching another episode of Dennis Deep Cuts, and I'll see you in two weeks. Until then, stay wild, my friends. Bye-bye.